This book, Hashirim Asher Lishlomo, was the first ever collection of motets composed for the synagogue, with Hebrew lyrics from the Jewish liturgy set in the style of early Baroque church music. The composer, Salomone Rossi Hebreo, signed his dedication on this book on Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan, 5383, October 5th, 1622. And the music came off the presses and into circulation just a few months after that. In the introduction to this book, Rossi's friend, Rabbi Leone Modena, wrote that Rossi had been composing these motets for some time and only recently had finally selected 33 of them to be published. Day by day, he entered into his notebook, a psalm of David, or plans for a prayer or worship or praise and divine song, until he succeeded in gathering a selection of these into a collection, making some of them available. But here's our question. Did Rossi's music exist only on paper, or was it actually performed? And assuming it was performed, how often and where was it heard? We will search for performances in Rossi's time, and then we will observe what was likely a silence of two centuries, followed by the music's rediscovery and revival in the 19th century. Come, let's look for clues. For many reasons, it should be obvious that Rossi intended his synagogue music to be heard. First of all, most of the texts that he set are taken from the synagogue liturgy. Furthermore, look at these three motets, Kedusha, Kaddish, and Baruchu. Rossi composed these three specifically in a manner to suit liturgical practice. The composer created a clear demarcation between the parts of the liturgy that the choir would sing and the parts that the congregation or the cantor would sing. Look at the canto part for Rossi's setting of the Kedusha. Notice the double bars interrupting the flow of the music. These were signals to the choir to pause and wait for the cantor or congregation to chant their parts. In fact, a similar convention was used in church music of that time. Now look at the text of the Italian Kedusha. Here, shown in red, are the sections that Rossi composed. If he were doing this only for his own pleasure, there would have been no reason for him to omit the other words. And we find the same setup in Baruch Hu and Kaddish. The only reason for Rossi to make such a division would be if he expected the music to be used in a liturgical service. Now, in addition to the synagogue motets, some of the 33 pieces in this collection were probably composed for paraliturgical performance. In other words, sacred texts sung outside of the synagogue. Yesusum Midbar from Isaiah chapter 35 may have been composed for performance by the Shomrim La Boke confraternity. We have evidence that the members of that academy performed polyphonic music by other composers, why not Rossi? 
And we know for certain that the final piece in the collection, Le Mi Echpotz, was written specifically for performance at the wedding celebration on May 18, 1623, of Rachel Copio, the sister-in-law of Rossi's patron, Moshe Sulam. <laughs> Rossi's friend, Rabbi Modena, expected this music to be sung. In his dedicatory poem, Modena wrote that this music was written for synagogue services and for weddings and for all generations. Yachdav, to rejoice and sing before the ark on Shabbat and all festivals for all ritual observances with strength and delight for a groom and his bride, for fathers and sons. Modena seemed certain that this innovative synagogue music would become popular. I am sure that from the day this collection is published, those who learn music will multiply in the Jewish community in order to sing and create beauty for our God with these compositions and with others like them. And Modena specifies that this music should be sung in the synagogue. Give honor to God with this music to glorify the place of the synagogues and other joyous sacred happenings at the appropriate times. Modena not only expected that this music would be sung, he also witnessed that it was sung and was enjoyed by the congregation. When people sang them, they were delighted with their many good qualities. The listeners, too, were radiant, everyone finding it pleasant to hear and wishing to hear more. Here's another hint. There were some rabbis who objected to this music being performed in the synagogue liturgy. And then other rabbis had to come to its defense. If this controversial music had not been performed, there would be no need to attack or defend it. In 1605, there was an incident in a synagogue in Ferrara when polyphonic music was sung as part of the service. Rabbi Modena wrote, Then a man stood up to kick out the singers, saying, but it's not proper. So Rabbi Modena wrote a lengthy defense of choral music in the synagogue, and he appended the support of five other prominent rabbis. Again, if this controversial music had not been performed, there would be no need to defend it. Modena wrote, I do not see how anyone with a brain in his skull could cast any doubt on the propriety of praising God in song in the synagogue on special Sabbaths and on festivals. That also suggests that this polyphonic music was not intended to be a part of every synagogue service. It was reserved for special Sabbaths and festivals. Here are two other rabbinic voices. Rabbi Ezra Defano. And these are the sweet voices that sound in meter and measure according to the conventions of musica, and I praise their composition. And remember, any time we see the Italian word musica, spelled with Hebrew letters, it refers to Italian-style polyphonic compositions as opposed to traditional Jewish chant. And here is Rabbi Baruch ben Samuel. And anyone who opposes those who play and sing music in the synagogue on Shabbat and festivals and weddings and circumcisions has never seen the light. Let's look at evidence that Rossi's music was performed not only in his hometown of Mantua, but in other cities as well. As we mentioned, Rabbi Modena had written about an occasion in 1605 when he was 
at a synagogue in Ferrara, and a choir was singing polyphonic music in the synagogue. Mordenet might even have been the leader. Was it Rossi's music? Perhaps. We have six or eight knowledgeable men who know something about the art of song, by which I mean musica, men of our congregation, may their rock keep them and grant them long life, who on holidays and festivals raise their voices in the synagogue and joyfully sing songs, praises, hymns, and melodies such as Enkeloheinu, Aleinu Lishabeach, Yigdal, Adon Olam, and so forth, to the glory of the Lord in an orderly relationship of the voices according to this art. Note again the use of the word musica to indicate polyphonic Italian-style music, rather than the traditional monophonic modal synagogue chant. The Venetian rabbi Benzion Zarfati, in a letter dated August 6, 1605, mentions vocal art music performed in the synagogue in Padua. I like how Rabbi Modena has ruled to authorize the joyous singing of prayers to the order and rhythm of musica. It reminds me of the days of my youth, when I diligently entered the doors of Torah in the holy congregation of Padua, a city at that time full of scholars, whose regal head was the great sage, my lord, teacher and master, his honored eminence, Rabbi Mayer Ben Isaac Katzenellenbogen. May his saintly memory be blessed. We used to sing in the synagogue the whole order of the Kedusha many times at his request. Rabbi Nathaniel Traboto in the city of Modena, Italy, knew of Rossi's music and he praised it. In 1645, he commended Rossi for writing music in which words were not unnecessarily repeated, which would have been a halachic problem. And as to repeating words, I never heard the learned de Rossi and his company do it. Among them was my honorable late wife, Judith, who was learned and skilled in playing the lute and viol, and she sang the musica of the Keter Kedusha without repeating any words. Polyphonic music was heard in a Senegalia synagogue. In 1652, the same Rabbi Traboto wrote in a letter, In the city of Senegalia, in days gone by, there were also two ensembles who sang and made music on holidays and festivals, singing the Psalms of David and also in celebration of weddings and circumcisions in honor of our God. And in Mantua and Lombardy, it was customary to sing with musica, psalms and hymns on holidays and festivals. Rabbi Modena's student in Venice, Samuel Nachmias, converted to Christianity in 1649 and took the name Giulio Morosini. In his diary, he wrote about a musical service that he witnessed at the Sephardi Synagogue in Venice in 1628. Io mi ricordo bene di quello che a tempi miei successe in Venezia. I remember well what happened during my time in Venice around 1628. It was around then, if I am not mistaken, when the Jews fled Mantua because of the war and came to Venice. Since the city of Mantua flourished in all sorts of studies, the Jews also applied themselves to music and to musical instruments. Those who arrived in Venice founded an academy of music in the ghetto, where they sang twice a week in the evening, and only the most important and wealthy congregants of the ghetto attended and sustained it, of which I myself was one. My teacher, Rabbi Leon da Modena, was the conductor.
In that year, two rich and splendid persons, one of whom was a member of the same academy, had been designated as Chatan Torah and Chatan Bereshit for this festival held at the Spanish synagogue, which was richly decorated and adorned with silver and great jewels. As per our custom, the musicians organized themselves into two choirs and on the two evenings, beginning on Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah, they sang harmonized music in the Hebrew language, parts of the evening service and several psalms, as well as the afternoon service, that is the vespers of the last day, with solemn music which lasted several hours into the night. Many noble men and ladies gathered, offering great applause, so that they had to guard the door with quite a few captains and policemen, so that everything might continue peacefully. Among the instruments brought to the synagogue was an organ, even though it was not permitted by the rabbis, since it is an instrument that is normally played in our churches. But what of it? All of this was just a flash in the pan. The academy lasted only a short time, and music returned to its former practices. A flash in the pan, Morosini wrote. Was it indeed the last gasp of choral polyphony in the synagogues in Italy and beyond? From the middle of the 17th century on, there seems to be a silence of 200 years. No more descriptions of performances of Rossi's synagogue music. No one objects to it. No one defends it. At least, no source that has yet been discovered. Rossi's Hashirim seems to have been lost and forgotten. In 1929, the great historian of Jewish music, Abraham Tzvi Edelson, wrote, we do not know exactly how long Rossi's music was sung in the Italian synagogues. At any rate, it could not have lasted long, because a few years later, in 1630, when Mantua was swept over by war and was captured by Emperor Ferdinando II, 1,800 Jews were expelled from the city. The glorious era, an era which illuminated their darkness for a short while, ceased for the Jews in northern Italy with the Austrian regime, and with it all desire for the Ars Nova was killed in the Jew. Soon Rossi's music was forgotten, and the Italian synagogue went back to the old traditional song with more zeal than ever. And in 1959, the eminent scholar Cecil Roth wrote, from the prodigious rarity of Salomone de Rossi's synagogal music, it would seem that the original issue was almost thumbed out of existence. It was never republished. Obviously, de Rossi's gallant experiment had failed. There is actually one piece of evidence that Rossi's music was known during that period. Moses ben Avraham of Nikolsburg a Christian who had converted to Judaism, owned a copy of the Quinto part book of Rossi's Hashirim. He added a few scraps of musical notation in his own handwriting. But possessing the music for only one of the voice parts, Moses ben Abraham could have had no idea of the full soundscape of what he held. So, there were copies in a few libraries, but again, these were isolated books, no one could perform them unless they had a complete set. And remember that in those days, music was not published in score format. Each voice part had their own book with just their own part. There was a copy in the collection of the Christian Hebraist Johann Christoph Wolf. There was a copy in the library of Julius Fust. In 1861, the Viennese rabbi Adolf Jelinek makes reference to the Alto part book of Hashirim, found in the Imperial Library of Vienna. Cantor Solomon Zulzer had owned that book and had donated it to the Imperial Library. Now, here is where it gets interesting. 
Soon after that, the Parisian cantor Samuel Naumburg managed to acquire the basso and tenor part books. Let's hear about it from Naumburg's own words. Il me reste maintenant à faire savoir au lecteur comment je suis parvenu It now remains for me to let the reader know how I managed to find the fascicles constituting the set of Hebrew songs by Rossi. For several years, I owned the tenor and bass parts of this work. They had been discovered by Baron Edmond de Rothschild during one of his trips to Italy, where he had acquired them. Returning to Paris, the Baron gave them to Mr. Samuel David, the exceptional director of the choir of our temple, who wanted to give them to me. I appealed to the kindness of music lovers and scholars, particularly my co-religionists in Italy, to whom I begged, if you have any of these volumes, please let me know. Send me or let me copy the parts that I'm missing so that I can put the music in score and transcribe it into modern notation. By a coincidence that I cannot bless too much, the venerable chief rabbi of Mantua, Marco Mor Tara had on the shelves of his library the set of part books almost complete, and most importantly, he had the volumes that I was missing. He was willing to offer them to me, and as you can easily understand, I enthusiastically accepted a proposal that allowed me to carry out my project and to revive this remarkable production of our eminent Sahel region. Naumburg was finally able to publish an edition of Hashirim in Paris in 1877. From our perspective, more than a century later, we could easily find fault with Naumburg's editorial procedures, but at least the music was out there. For the first time in two centuries, it was being seen, it was being heard. Rossi's sacred music now began to be performed in Europe and the United States. Word was out, although primarily only within the community of synagogue musicians. We begin to see more and more references to Rossi in Vienna, in Königsberg, in Berlin, and elsewhere. In 1954, the Sacred Music Press in New York issued a reprint of Naumburg's edition. Now this music became easily accessible to all synagogue musicians in America. And in that same year, transcontinental publications in New York issued Isidore Fried's arrangement of Hashirim, adapted to accommodate the liturgy of the American Reform Synagogue. It was scored for organ, cantor, and four-part choir. In 1957, Columbia Masterworks issued the first recording of some of the motets from Hashirim with the New York Pro Musica under the direction of Noah Greenberg. In 1967, a new modern scholarly edition of Hashirim, edited by Fritz Rico, was published in New York by the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. But the greatest modern scholar of Salomoni Rossi and his music was Don Haran, Beginning in 1987, Haran published dozens of articles about Rossi and his milieu, and an amazing book. In 2003, the American Institute of Musicology, no less, issued Professor Haran's meticulously edited edition of all of Rossi's music, the complete works, including, of course, Hashirim. Now there are many performing editions of Hashirim widely available, plus CDs, websites, YouTube videos, See, Rossi composed this psalm in the same way that any composer composed at that time. 
with the aim of amplifying the text and moving the emotions of the listeners. And a wonderful film featuring the early music ensemble Profeti della Quinta. When he published the first collection ever of originally composed music for Hebrew prayers. The name of this astonishing figure was Salomone Rossi Ebreo. Salomone Rossi, the Jew. Was Rossi's music performed in his own time? A resounding yes. And not only in Rossi's Mantua, but in Venice, Padua, Senigallia, Modena, Ferrara. And now, 400 years after its publication, Kol Hashirim Nishmab Artsenu. The voice of Rossi is once again heard in the land. 